Hello, and welcome to the latest legal update for the Solicitors Group, TSG Legal TV channel. My name is Paul Clark. I'm a commercial property lawyer, consultant with Cripps Harris Hall uh, of Tunbridge Wells, and I've been a lawyer, commercial property lawyer for over 40 years. Today, I will be discussing freehold easements and covenants. Uh, surprisingly important, the Law Commission uh, in its massive report a couple of years ago estimated that over 75% of titles in the UK are affected by an easement or a covenant, some more than one, and these can have a significant impact on value. Uh, they are, however, treated by many of us as less important than real property. Uh, that's a mistake. If a client came in to see you and said he was building an extension, uh, but unfortunately the plans uh, meant that the extension would overlap the neighbour's garden by a couple of inches, that's all right, isn't it? You'd be very quick to say, no, you cannot trespass on your neighbour's property. But if a developer comes in and says, um, my, my uh, roof extension is going to uh, impact on my neighbour's rights to light just a little bit, that's all right, isn't it? The temptation is to say, well, maybe. Uh, recent case law and the way the courts are going suggest that that would be the wrong advice. The essentials to a legal easement are pretty well known. They were stated in a case in 1956, Rhea Ellenborough Park. An easement must have a, a, a dominant and servient tenement. Uh, if you gave me a right of way over your garden, uh, that would be very kind of you, but it would be a mere personal license. If you gave a right of way to me over your garden for the benefit of my land in Kent, chances are that wouldn't be an easement either because my land in Kent is unlikely to benefit from a right of way across your property. There isn't, as the phrase quaintly puts it, sufficient propinquity. It's essential that the benefited land and the burdened land are owned and occupied separately. And finally, it's essential that the right granted is capable of being an easement. You can't, for example, have an easement to a view or privacy or uh, an easement of giving you a right to make a noise. Uh, there was a fascinating case a few years ago where uh, the owner of a, a, a Jacobean house brought an action against the Ministry of Defence because Harrier jump jet pilots were plaguing him. They were taking off and landing in a nearby airfield. They'd been doing it for 20 or more years, 18 hours a day, and he'd had enough of it. So he brought an action for nuisance. In defence, the ministry uh, suggested that they had a right to make a noise because Harrier jump jets had been using the airfield for over 20 years. And the court said, no, you can't have an easement to make a noise. Interestingly, you can't have an easement of television signals either. A case went all the way to the House of Lords uh, a few years ago when residents in the East End of London complained that the Canary Wharf tower block, 800 feet high, was uh, impeding signals from Crystal Palace. Um, and the House of Lords said, no, you can't have a right to television signals. Interestingly, TV signals are on the electromagnetic spectrum, just a different wavelength to light. And light is, of course, capable of being an easement. The House of Lords explained that and said that had uh, the right to light not been an ancient right, they would not now have uh, given such a right. Use of a garden for pleasure, the right to park a car in a defined area, these are all capable of being easements. Easements may be acquired expressly or by implication. Express grant is either by way of a deed of grant or more usually as an adjunct to a transfer or a lease. Implied grant can be made on the occasion of a transfer or a lease. The doctrine of Wielden and Burroughs, for example, implies quasi-easements into a transfer or lease of part. Section 62 of the Law of Property Act 
implies a number of uh, rights uh, with any conveyance. Both of those can be excluded and indeed should be from a transfer or lease of part. If you're acting, of course, for the tenant or the transferee, you want to make sure that all the rights you need are expressly granted in the document. Presumption uh, is the other way of, an Im of implied right. Presumption from long usage. And uh, most implied rights these days from long usage are, uh, are given under the Prescription Act of 1832, uh, defined as one of the worst drafted acts on the statute book, uh, but uh, all lawyers know that it exists, and uh, if a person would qualify for a right, if they took it to court, then the chances are they'll get it. Easements today, if they're granted out of registered land, need to be registered in order to be valid legal easements. And by registration, I mean not just noted on the register. You have to complete a, a, an application to change the register, a form AP1. What if you can't? What if, for example, the uh, document you're trying to register is a short lease uh, which contains easements? Uh, the short lease is not registrable, the easements have to be registered. Well, you apply on an AP1. You won't get a land certificate or a title document. Uh, all that will happen is that the rights will be noted on the freehold or superior title. Uh, the uh, better way of dealing with easements on the grant of a short lease is to put them in a covenant rather than in a schedule of rights. Uh, that means uh, if the landlord covenants to allow the tenant to use the rights, that they don't have to be registered at all. Uh, the covenant will automatically take effect on the register. Now, there have been a lot of cases on easements. Uh, we need to run through a few of them. Uh, can you, when you have a right that uh, attaches to your land that you enjoy, extend the area of land that that right benefits? The short answer, uh, following an ancient case, Harrison Flower, is with great difficulty. Uh, very occasionally, the courts have held that rights can uh, attach to ancillary land, but that's very rare indeed. The normal rule is if you own a piece of land A, which has a right across land B, you cannot extend A into adjoining land C and use the same right across land B. What if your existing right is to use land that uh, uh, changes its character? Uh, say the land is currently residential uh, and it enjoys a right of way and then changes its use to commercial. Well, if the right is an express right, uh, then it all turns on what the document says. If you have a right of way at all times and for all purposes, then uh, you can use it at all times and for all purposes. But if it's an implied right, then that right will be uh, judged by reference to what it was at the time the right arose or what it has been used for meanwhile. Can you change that use? Well, a 2004 case, McAdam, Holmes and Robinson set out the rules. Uh, yes, you can uh, change the use so long as you do not also intensify that use. Uh, you can do either with impunity, but you can't do both. Um, drafting easements can be tricky. Uh, what if uh, an easement was granted... Uh, for the use of water supply in common with the grantor? Answer, uh, in the case of Mitchell and Potter and James, Court of Appeal decision, um, the person to whom you've granted the right can take all the water. Uh, it doesn't have to leave any for the grantor, even though the right's granted in common with the grantor. Very important, if you need to ration scarce resources, that you do so explicitly. A number of recent cases dealt with the issue of interference with an easement. Um, in particular, 
rights to light. This reinforces the point I made earlier that we wouldn't dream of advising a client to interfere with somebody else's land. Uh, but what happens to rights of light? In the case of Dennis Regan and Paul Properties, Dennis Regan occupied a first floor apartment. Paul Properties were extending a property on the other side of the road. It was going to have an effect on light to Mr. Regan's living room. And he said, stop, I don't want you to do that work. Um, the builder brought in a rights of light expert who said, well, the, the, the interference was going to be marginal, it's going to be small. Uh, it's unlikely the courts would grant an injunction. They would just, and uh, recommended that his client offered Mr. Regan 15,000 pounds. He turned it down. He said, I don't want money, I want, right. I want light. So the case came to court because the builder carried on working. And the court said, uh, well, we don't think the interference with light is sufficiently small to be compensatable in damages, even though on the evidence it wasn't a £15,000 loss, it was only 5000 And even though the cost to the developer of making the alterations needed to stop interference would have been over £200,000. The court was applying rules in a case of Shelfer that had been decided 100 years before, but applying them quite strictly. And uh, even more strictly, in a more recent case uh, involving properties in Leeds, the case of HXR UK and Heaney, where uh, an old Victorian property, the Yorkshire Penny Bank, had been lovingly restored, they said. Uh, the property next door had a couple of floors added to the roof. It interfered with no more than 1% of the light to the Victorian property. And here, although the developer carried on doing the work, the owner of the property didn't, uh, carry, didn't uh, do anything about it, didn't bring the action. It was the developer who bought the action. And uh, even so, the court said, uh, this was uh, an interference which uh, was capable of uh, being uh, remedied by injunction only, not by damages. Uh, so uh, the moral of the tale is uh, easements are rights in property every bit as much as, a, 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 as real estate and uh, the courts are protecting them as such. Easements cannot easily be extinguished. Even if someone builds a brick wall across a right-of-way, uh, the easement isn't necessarily lost. In fact, it's probably safe to say the only way today you can extinguish an easement is by agreement. Implied easements are, however, alive and well. And the last case I want to mention before wrapping up is the case of London Tara Hotel and Kensington Close Hotel, a case where... Back in the 70s, one hotel, Tara, granted the other uh, a right to use a service road. It was given in a licence. Um, solicitors often forget that licences do not run with the land. If there's a change of ownership of property, the licence comes to an end. It's a personal right. Here, the hotels changed hands many times. In fact, the first time they changed hands was in 1980. The license ceased, and as a result, the use of the road after that uh, was unlawful. After 20 years, however, uh, the Kensington Close Hotel had acquired a prescriptive right to use the road for the purposes for which it had been using it during that time, and the Court of Appeal said only last year that that right was valid. Very good case to read if you have an issue with implied rights.